I conclude my remarks upon this third chapter with observing, in the defense, page 53, quote, that he gives vent to his invectives against our reforming period, particularly against the Assembly 1638, as essay page 20 and 21, unquote. Unto which Mr. Curry replies in the vindication, page 58, quote, But has he told what these invectives are? No. You must take his bare affirmation for truth. And who, says he, can think Mr. Wilson, who is so tender, that he would not for a world sit in a judicatory of any such church as the Church of Scotland, will speak anything but what is truth, unquote. I heartily pray that both Mr. Curry and I had more tenderness than any of than any of us have. But the above sneering manner in which he delivers himself is no great evidence of any tenderness of spirit about him. Yea, to me, tis an evidence of that levity of spirit that frequently discovers itself in the, in his management of this subject. As for the above charge he brings against me, that is, that I would have my re reader to take my bare affirmation for truth. The reader may see the injustice of it from my words above quoted, where I direct him to the pages of the essay, where he will find how Mr. Curry treats the Act of Assembly 1638, which he frequently quotes as an unreasonable act, and more unreasonable than any since that time, and tells his reader, quote, that some would say that thereby that assembly looked upon themselves to be infallible in their decisions, and also that they bind themselves to act by implicit faith, unquote. Is there no invective in all this? Defense chapter 1, section 3. I endeavor to declare the truth, the true state of the question betwixt the present judicatories and the associate presbytery, and I make several observes for clearing the same. I must leave it to the reader to compare them with Mr. Curry's vindication, and let him judge for himself if Mr. Curry has done justice to my observes as I laid them. I shall only give two instances wherein Mr. Curry either clouds or perverts the true state of the question. The first instance I give is what contains matter of wonder to Mr. Curry, and because it contains something that he says he wonders at, therefore I shall briefly notice it. It is upon the third observe that I make for fixing the state of the question, and because my words are seldom fully or fairly represented by Mr. Curry, I shall report them myself, and they stand thus. Defense, page 65, quote, It is one thing to depart from the communion of a church, and another thing to depart from communion with a party in that church, though the greatest number who are carrying on a course of defection and backsliding. The seceding brethren have always refused, and they do upon good grounds refuse, that they have made any secession from the Church of Scotland. If the Church of Scotland is considered as her principles are held forth from the Word of God and her confession of faith, larger and shorter catechisms, form of church government, directory for worship, and other laudable acts and constitutions of this national church, the seceding ministers have openly declared and acknowledged their adherence to all these in their judicial act and testimony. Or, if her principles are considered as they are solemnly avouched and sworn to in the National Covenant of Scotland and the Solemn League and Covenant of the Three Nations, they have also in like manner in their foresaid act and testimony acknowledged the inviolable obligation of these solemn oaths and covenants. But if the Church of Scotland is considered as represented in her present judicatories, they own that they have declared a, a secession from them, and that they cannot now act in conjunction with them as members of the same ecclesiastical body, and that because they are carrying on a course of defection and backsliding from our covenanted uniformity in doctrine, worship, government, and discipline, notwithstanding of many representations and remonstrances made before them under the contrary. Therefore the question under our consideration is not concerning secession from the Church of Scotland, but concerning secession from the present judicatories of this national church, unquote. I think my above words do fully explain themselves, yet Mr. Curry thinks fit to make the following reflection upon them. In his vindication, page 71, quote, I could never but wonder what the brethren mean by refusing that they had separated from the Church of Scotland. But when come the 65th page of his defense, he tells us that by the Church of Scotland they mean her principles contained in the Confession of Faith, etc., and other laudable acts and constitutions of this national church, and they refuse that they have made secession from these, unquote, etc., I shall pass Mr. Curry's charge on that our manner of stating the question as above is far from plain dealing, and that, some say, it deserves no other name than gross dissimulation, page 72. Tis unpleasant to me to rake into his frequent charges and insinuations, which favor so much of a bitter and uncharitable spirit. I shall only notice the reason he gives, why he wonders at what is contained in my above manner of stating the question, as it stands in his vindication, page 71, at the foot. Says he, quote, Can she be a Presbyterian church without judicatories? Who could speak of this without a smile? 
to tell people the doctrine maintained in the Confession of Faith is the Church of Scotland? If so, then she is a pure church indeed, unquote. As for his above query, which no doubt Mr. Curry reckons a very pungent one, I ask him again, where was the Presbyterian Church of Scotland when, for several years after 1661, she had neither assemblies, synods, presbyteries, nor sessions? I hope she was not extinguished during that period. Nay, the Lord preserved her, and all such who in any corner of the land adhered unto and in their sphere witnessed for the covenanted principles of this church were, were the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. I shall leave Mr. Curry to his laugh or smile when I have told him that, for my part, I judge it matter of mourning when I see one of his profession and character diverting himself after this manner upon such a grave subject, when he says, quote, to tell people the doctrine maintained in the confession of faith, etc., is the Church of Scotland, unquote. I ask, who is it that tells people this? In my observe, I speak not of principles and doctrines abstractly, but of the principles of the Church of Scotland held forth from the word of God, etc., and as they are solemnly avouched and sworn to in our national covenant. When I speak of the principles of the Church, and of principles avouched and sworn unto, do not the words plainly import that such doctrines and principles have been owned and confessed by a body of people in our land, yea, by the body of people in this land? And if it will satisfy Mr. Curry's wonder, he may go to our reformed divines who have treated upon the subject of secession, and he may learn from them the meaning of the terms as they are laid in my above observe concerning the state of the question. Thus they express themselves. We refuse that we have separated from this ancient apostolic church of Rome, but our separation is from the present corrupted and degenerate church of Rome, as Turretin, de necessary schision, dispute, Prima, section 26, and Vote de Desperata, Causa Papetis, Libel 3, section Tertia, cap 10. And though Mr. Curry should wonder, laugh, or smile at it, I must tell him that our secession is not from the primitive reforming and covenanting Church of Scotland, but from the present backsliding judicatories. Tis like Mr. Curry will now... Mr. Curry will now, I cry out, that put the Church of Scotland upon the same footing with the Church of Rome, as he does very unjustly, in Vindication, page 29, upon a comparison for illustration, which I make in the defense, page 20. But I hope no fair reasoner will allege that comparisons of this kind put things or persons compared upon the same footing. I shall only further observe upon this head that when Mr. Curry or some others for him affirm in Vindication, page 80, quote, that the constitution of a church together with her principles is not the church, unquote. I cannot conceive what metaphysical idea or notion Mr. Curry or his learned assistants have formed to themselves of the term principles of a church. For my part, when I speak of the principles of a church, I cannot form to myself any other notion of the expression than a company of men and women associate together who have either owned or are owning and confessing such principles. I shall only give another instance of Mr. Curry's perverting the state of the question, and it is his affirming that our present secession and erect ourselves into a presbytery is a setting up a Presbyterian church within a Presbyterian church. Vindication, pages 13 and 74. This I likewise call a perverting the state of the question, and my reason for it is that this national church, though she bears the Presbyterian name and has the outward form and shadow of Presbyterian government, yet she is exercising a lordly and magisterial power over the heritage of God. She is ruling the flock of Christ with rigor and perverting the keys of government and discipline, and therefore though she has the Presbyterian name, yet she has not the thing itself, and her government is not a whit better than if its form and model were prolatical. And if Mr. Curry can bear it, without charging me with setting his established church upon an equal footing with Rome and England, I shall give him another comparison for the illustration of his subject, that is, the secession of the Protestants from the Church of Rome was never reckoned a rearing up of a Christian church within a Christian church, but only the departure of such who desire to cleave to the pure and primitive institutions of Christianity from the majority of an ecclesiastical body who, under the Christian name and profession, had overthrown and subverted in innumerable instances the pure doctrines and institutions of Christianity. In the like manner, the secession of Protestant dissenters from the Church of England is not a rearing up of a Protestant church within a Protestant church, but a departure from the majority of that ecclesiastical body who, under the Protestant name and profession, retain many of the abominations of Rome, both in her worship, government, and discipline, and who refuse to reform. 
Even so, our secession from the present established Church of Scotland is not in erecting a Presbyterian church within a Presbyterian church, but a departure from the ecclesiastical communion with an ecclesiastic body who refuse in their ecclesiastical capacity to make a public judicial confession of many important and weighty truths held forth from the word of God in our confession of faith in opposition unto the open and manifest injuries that have been done in the same and who are, in many particular instances, subverting our Presbyterian order and government. Though Mr. Curry alleges, quote, that the brethren do not understand their own principles, unquote, and, quote, that they have no fixed principle upon this head, unquote, or, quote, that they clash with one another upon this head, unquote, vindication page 72, Yet I hope from what I have observed, the reader will see that the brethren are consistent with themselves, with one another, and with the truth itself when they affirm that they have made a secession from the present judicatories, but not from the Church of Scotland. I shall conclude this chapter when I have observed that our present secession from the judicatories is not a secession from the Christian Catholic visible church. This is our New Testament Mount Zion unto which a gospel ministry and gospel ordinances are primarily given. 1 Corinthians 12.28 but our secession is a departure from a corrupt part of the Catholic visible body upon the account of their defections and backslidings continued in and from which they refuse to reform, though the proper means have been used to reclaim them. This observation leans to the first of my four general observances on Church Communion, Defense Chapter 1, Section 1, and if this were duly noticed, it answers all the arguments that Mr. Curry brings against our secession from the practice of the prophets under the Old Testament and from the practice of Christ and his apostles as the same is recorded by the evangelists, as I have more fully evinced in the Defense Chapter 3, Section 1. Again, our secession is not a departure from any of the Protestant churches insofar as they maintain the Protestant testimony against Rome anti-Christian, but it is a departure from ecclesiastical union in conjunction with judicatories who have, in many particular instances, departed from the Protestant Reformed testimony as the same was lifted up in Scotland in her reforming and covenanting times, according to my seventh observe in the above quoted section. Likewise, our present secession is not a departure from the principles of the Church of Scotland, as they have been confessed, acknowledged, and sworn unto by this whole church and land, but it is a departure from ecclesiastical union in conjunction with the present judicatories who not only refuse to confess and acknowledge many of the above principles in opposition to the contradiction they have met with, but who likewise in many particular instances walk contrary to them. And in the last place, to use some of Mr. Shield's words in his treatise on church communion, pages 15, 23, 24, our present secession is not a departure from union in conjunction with each with such judicatories as are promoting reformation in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, and opposing popery, prelacy, erastianism, sectarianism, and whatsoever is contrary to sound doctrine and the power of godliness, according to the word of God, our confession of faith and covenants. Nay, in all our proceedings we plead for union in conjunction with such. But our secession is a departure from judicatories who, instead of promoting are bearing down a judicial testimony to many important truths, and who are exercising a lordly dominion over the flock and heritage of God, and who are giving up the rights and privileges of Christ's kingdom unto Erastian usurpations upon the same, and who, instead of returning to the Lord and to our Reformation standards and testimony agreeable to the word of God, do persecute and cast out their synagogues, and cast out of their synagogues such as desire to confess our reform principles and in their stations to adhere to the same according to the rules laid down in the holy scripture and the solemn covenant engagements that this whole church and land are under to the most high god but this leads me to chapter three